Amen. Great job, Charlotte. Who else wants to read all of those names in verse 1? You just rolled those off like it was nothing. Well done. Uh, Friends, it's great to be with you on this holiday, 4th of July weekend. Uh, My name is Charlie Dunn, and if you have been with us for the last month, we've been in this uh, teaching series where we've been majoring in the minors. And, you know, one of our church members said that wouldn't be a bad name for a baseball documentary if you were trying to... Um, track minor league players who are trying to get into the major leagues. But um, for our purposes, we have been looking at the major themes in the minor prophets. Some of you are familiar with those books in the Old Testament known as the minor prophets. These are some of the shorter books in the Bible. And so what that has done is it's allowed us to be able to really take uh, one of these minor prophets each Sunday and to look at the major themes within it. And today we're going to do that Uh, with the book known as Zephaniah. Now, Zephaniah continues uh, with some of the major themes that we've seen in some of the other prophets. We'll recognize some of the same things that we've considered in prophets like Amos and Hosea and Micah and Nahum. Um, Those themes include the fact that God is a God, Zephaniah says, who is very concerned about justice. He's very concerned um, that every person, regardless of who they know, regardless of how much money they have, regardless of their status or their race, that everybody get equal treatment under the law, and that was not happening. And more than that, God is a God who's very concerned, especially for the poor, that his people would care for the poor, that they would look out for the weak, for the, um, the vulnerable in their society, that they wouldn't take advantage of them and oppress them. And what we see in these prophets, and we see it again in Zephaniah, is that God is very angry. He's very upset over the way in which his people are engaging in injustice. And along with that injustice, God is very concerned with their idolatry, idolatry that often leads them into injustice, the ways that they are worshiping and chasing after all of these other gods, and it leads them to mistreat others as they do. And because of this idolatry and because of this injustice, God warns his people time and again through the prophets that he is going to do something that he's going to act, that he's going to bring his judgment upon them, and that he's going to cast his people out of their land into exile. And so all of these themes are repeated within the prophet Zephaniah. You heard some of them in the first chapter um, that Charlotte read from a moment ago. And yet, I'll tell you, one of the themes that, that shows up in the book of Zephaniah that has blessed me uh, so much this week is that in the midst of these warnings of God's coming judgment, what we have in the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, is, in my opinion, one of the most vivid and beautiful pictures of God's salvation that you will find anywhere in the Bible. One of the most incredible windows into the loving heart of our God. And so what I want to do this morning is to especially focus on that theme of this God who comes to save that we see in Zephaniah chapter 3. And as we do so, I am reminded of a scene that occurs right near the end of a movie. The movie is the first movie uh, within the Lord of the Rings trilogy, The Fellowship of the Ring. Now, I know I've quoted from The Lord of the Rings from time to time. I've used those illustrations. But I've got to tell you, I've been listening to this book a biography of one of my favorite preachers who recently died, a man named Tim Keller. Now, I like The Lord of the Rings. This guy loved The Lord of the Rings. He knew those stories inside and out. And I love this in the biography. It said his congregation, they always knew when he had not spent as much time preparing his sermon that week, when he would pull illustrations from The Lord of the Rings. For him, it was just like second nature. He knew he could use those uh, whenever he needed to rely upon them. Hopefully, that's not the case uh, this morning. Uh, I'm using this because I think it really does fit this passage so well. And I know I've used this illustration uh, once before, so forgive me if you remember this, but uh, there is this scene right at the end of The Fellowship of the Ring, the movie, not the book, um, where there is this character by the name of Boromir. Now, Boromir um, is the son of a guy by the name of Denethor. Denethor is the steward of a kingdom called Gondor. He's been ruling over this kingdom, but he is not the king. 
but he's essentially functioned like the king because he's been able to, to rule over this, this kingdom for years, and Boromir expects that when his father dies, that he will become the steward, that he will be able to rule over Gondor. But then in the course of this storyline, he meets this man by the name of Aragorn. And it just so happens that Aragorn is actually the long-lost heir to the throne of Gondor. He is the one who is supposed to be king over Gondor. And as you might expect, Boromir does not love that. He is very much threatened by Aragorn. He has a lot of hostility towards Aragorn. There is no love lost between them. But when you get to the end of this movie, when you get to the end of this, this particular storyline, Boromir and Aragorn are fighting in a battle against a common enemy, and Boromir has been shot fatally. Aragorn rushes to his defense, but he gets there too late, and as Boromir is lying there dying, and he's looking up at Aragorn, he says these words to him. It's almost like he has kind of a, a deathbed conversion of sorts. And he says to him, he says, I would have followed you, my brother, my captain, and my king. I would have followed you, my brother, my captain, my king. I'll tell you, I like this scene and I like those words so much that often that is a prayer that I like to pray to Jesus at the start of my day to try to remind myself of the salvation that is mine in Jesus. And I'll say to Jesus, Jesus, I don't want to get to the end of this day. I don't want to get to the end of my life filled with regrets. I don't want to be saying to you, Jesus, at the end of my life, I wish I had followed you or I should have followed you. I want to say to you today, Jesus, I will follow you. And then I talk to him about what it means for him to be my brother, my captain, and my king. And three different aspects of the way that he has already saved me and rescued me that I want to bring home to my heart for that day. And so I want to use this this. this um, seen as, as a bit of an outline for our sermon this morning as we try to open up Zephaniah together. And we'll do that um, in the reverse order. So starting with this notion that this God who comes to save that Zephaniah speaks of, he is our king. That's really the, the central declaration of this hope of which Zephaniah speaks in, in chapter three. He says this in verse 15. He says, the king of Israel is in your midst. The king is in your midst. This is good news. But then he goes on to say that this king who's going to come is not just any king. He's not just a, a typical human king, not just even a king descended from the line of Israel's great king, David. Get this, verse 17, he says, the Lord your God is in your midst. In other words, this king who is going to come is not just a, an ordinary king. This king is none other than the king of creation the king of glory, the Lord, God himself, is the king who is going to come into his people's midst. And as Christians, we believe that this prophecy that Zephaniah spoke 600 years later was, was initially fulfilled. It was fulfilled when, when Jesus was born, Jesus who in his humanity was descended from King David, and yet who we believe was none other than the eternal king of creation the creator of all things, God himself in the flesh. The king has come, and we believe one day he will come again to rule and reign over all things. And Zephaniah says this is incredibly good news. If the king should come to be in our midst, it's great news, he says, but don't miss that it's not good news for everyone. It's not good news for everyone that God would come to reign as king in our midst. Certainly not those of whom Zephaniah speaks in chapter one, verse 12. Listen to this, he says, there were some people within the, the people of Judah to whom he is speaking, some people who said, the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. In other words, what they were saying is, I don't know if there's a God, maybe there is a God, but if there is a God, I don't think he cares how we live our lives. He's essentially indifferent to whether or not we are seeking to obey him, to keep his commands, to be faithful to his covenant, the Lord will do neither good nor bad. Uh, moreover, certainly uh, those in chapter two, the Assyrians, 
uh, might not be glad for God to come reign as king. Here's what they say, chapter 2, verse 15. The Assyrians say, I am the one, and there is none besides me. That is, in their pride, they imagine themselves to be God. So we're the masters of the universe. We're the ones who are in charge of what happens within the world. And so not for everyone would it be good news for God to come and reign as king. Certainly it would not be good news for any of us, even those of us in this room, who would still hold on to this desire to want to rule over our own lives instead of God. Now, I've been, I've been reading this new book. I started it this week. It's called The, the Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And it's a bit of a, a dense book, but um, I've started to read it, and, and what it does is it, it essentially argues that more than any people who've ever lived in the, in the history of our world, um, our, our culture, our time in history is very unique because never before have we tried to locate authority more within ourselves within our own intuitions, within our own feelings. And so it kind of traces some of the history behind this. It says in the past, um, often we would look to sources of authority that were external to us. Maybe maybe our family, maybe our community, uh, maybe to the church, maybe to scripture, maybe even to, to science or to agreed upon human reason. But it says never before has our culture so much said that that real authority is located within ourselves our own feelings, our own intuitions, that ultimately each of us, we are the ones who decide what is right or what is wrong, what is true or what is false, what is good or bad, what is beautiful or ugly, that we even have the authority to to choose our own gender regardless of what our physiology, what our bodies might be. Never before has a culture said that, that, that authority is so much located within each individual Person, the rise and triumph of the modern self. Now that's, that's true of the age in which we live, and yet we know that there's something about that that though it might seem very new, it's also very old. But this goes back to the Garden of Eden, actually from our very first parents, from the moment that, that Adam and Eve essentially said, look, we don't want to submit to the rule of God. We don't want him to decide what's right and wrong. We want to decide what's right and wrong for ourselves. We want to rule over ourselves. And that's, that certainly is this desire that all of us are familiar with then, isn't it? If you've been a teenager before, that feeling of saying, I, I don't want to have to be under the authority of my parents or teachers or coaches. I can't wait for the day when nobody's going to be able to tell me what to do. Maybe you faced that with, with bosses before, maybe bosses that you did not always admire, bosses you didn't always look up to, that feeling of, man, I just wish I could get out from under their authority. I wish I could be the one who was in charge, who was calling the shots. It's the reason why sometimes even with Jesus, if, if you seriously engage with Jesus, we would, if we were honest, say, look, I'd rather have a Jesus who is like a, a kind, encouraging, moral teacher Somebody who can give me good advice for my life, and then I get to decide whether I want to follow it or not. I don't necessarily want a Jesus who's going to give me commands as a king. There's something inside all of us that wants to get out from under authority. It's the reason why in the Lord of the Rings, Boromir, when he first meets Aragorn, he says, Gondor has no king. Gondor needs no king. There's something inside of all of us that wants to be our own king. We want to rule over our own lives, not God. And yet, as appealing as that may be, as seductive as that has become to our culture today, this idea that I get to be my own God, I get to rule over my own life, as appealing as that might be, it's really impossible. It's a fiction. It's an illusion. Because the reality is is there are so many things about us and so many things about this world that's external to us that we don't have any control over. Even our own bodies, even uh, how God has made us, we don't have control over that. And the more life that you live, you realize that there's so much in the world that makes you feel really vulnerable. So many things that we don't have power over as much as we might like to rule. And so we want to find ways to try to get power over a chaotic world. And along with that, I think there's something hardwired in all of us that we were made not to be God, we were made to worship God. We were made to serve God. 
And so even somebody who says, I really want to be my own God is still gonna end up worshiping something. You're still gonna end up serving something. And Zephaniah says that's what's happened with the people of Israel. That's what's happened. They've, they've begun to worship and serve other gods. Idolatry. Did you, did you notice the list of, of idols that Charlotte read for us a moment ago? He says the people, who are they worshiping? They're worshiping Baal. They're bowing down before the, the starry host. And they're worshiping a god called Molech. Now, now, those names might not be too familiar to you, but I think they've got a lot of um, very relevant applications for us even now. Their worship really still continues. Think about the god called Baal. You know that Baal was, was the god of prosperity. He was the god of fertility. You might make sacrifices to Baal because you were so intent upon wanting him to, to bless your life with prosperity. And of course, we can worship Baal still today, can't we? If you say, I want to be prosperous, if, if I could be prosperous, if I could, if I could have great wealth in my life, then I would feel significant, then I would feel secure. And if in the process of chasing after that prosperity, maybe you're willing to make sacrifices, you're willing to sacrifice your family. You're willing to, to, to focus so much on work that you don't have time for your family or, or maybe it compromises your health. You don't prioritize other relationships with people. Maybe you, you, you sacrifice the chance of having a relationship with God. People continue to, to worship Baal and that, that God of prosperity today to serve and give themselves away for Baal. Or think about the, the starry host. Do you know anyone who bows down before the starry host? But what, what, is, what does that mean? It means that, that actually this has been a, a trend throughout human history. People who say, you know, we live in a chaotic world. But maybe the stars, maybe the position of the stars and the planets has some sway over what happens in the world. So if I could just understand what's going on up there, then I could somehow kind of get ahead and make decisions that would help life work better for me. Now, that continues today, doesn't it, through astrology? Those who would, who would focus on, on horoscopes as a way to, to try to get some power or control, but that's the deeper idol, isn't it? This desire to have some control over a chaotic world. I think the more modern expression of that is probably politics. The more and more that we, we look to whoever is in political power as, as really what is gonna dictate how life goes for us. And, and, and frankly, look, if, if you would say that your, your hopes and your fears, your anxiety, your anger very much rises and falls with whoever is in political office. Or if you think, if we could just get this guy in office, or if my party were just in power, then life would be the way that I want it to be. Essentially, what is that? That's bowing down before the starry host. Um, looking to, to politics, essentially, as your God for how you're going to get control over life in a chaotic world. And then there's one more, and this is particularly tragic particularly desperate situation that would drive somebody into this sort of worship. That's the worship of a god called Moloch. Anybody ever heard of, of Moloch worship? Do you know what was unique about Moloch worship? People were so desperate if they would worship Moloch that they would be willing to sacrifice their own children in the worship of the god Moloch. They would give up that which was most precious to them because they were so desperate to try to get his blessing. I think we see that still today. Maybe if somebody is willing to embezzle funds from their company or to steal, uh, maybe somebody who is um, willing to commit crimes, to deal drugs, because they're, they're so desperate for their circumstances to change that they're willing to sacrifice even the preciousness of their own freedom in order to see some change. Those who are facing addictions can find themselves sometimes in this place where they're willing to, to risk their marriage, to risk their family, to risk their job just to, to get that substance for that next small high. Even we think about the fact that there are still people today who, who might actually literally um, be willing to sacrifice their own children. If they're faced with um, the, the potential shame uh, or the, the financial burden of an unwanted pregnancy. And, and I think that before we are too quick to judge, if you've never been in such a desperate circumstance before, before we would, we would think ourselves superior 
to anybody who might sacrifice those things in order to try to change their circumstances, we should, we should remember that, that maybe if we were in similar circumstances, we might be tempted to do the same. Uh, and yet, those sins are, are no less tragic. And so what God says is he says, because of the worship of these other gods, because of this idolatry that always leads to injustice, that always leads to giving up the things that are most precious to us and harming those things that are most precious to us, God says he is coming in judgment. He says he's gonna bring his judgment on his people. And that judgment is, is for the people of Judah gonna come very soon in the form of the Babylonians that will come and take them away into exile. And yet, notice the way that Zephaniah speaks of God's judgment it is actually not just specific to the people of Judah. It's not just specific to their time and to their place. The way that he speaks of God's judgment seems to foreshadow a far greater day of judgment, what the prophets call the day of the Lord. Listen to how that day is described. God says, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. In other words, he's saying, look, this, this judgment that God is gonna bring on the day of the Lord, it will be so cataclysmic that the whole created order is gonna be overturned. You notice the reference to the people and to the beasts and to the fish and to the sea. What is that? That's a reference back to Genesis 1. That's a reference back to creation. He's saying that when God brings his judgment at the end of history, it, it's going to, to overturn this created order. That on the day when God renews and restores all things, um, he is going to, to bring his judgment on the earth. And he says on that day, everyone, verse seven, chapter one, everyone will be silent before the sovereign Lord. Meaning what? Meaning that there will be nobody on the day of the Lord's judgment who will be able to say, God, you have done me wrong. God, you are unfair. God, you are unjust. Every mouth will be stopped on that day to recognize that God is just, and he would be just, to sweep us away in his judgment. And yet here's the amazing thing. The amazing thing is that if you are a Christian here this morning, you're somebody who's taken refuge in King Jesus. You have bowed the knee to Jesus. The amazing thing is that the day of judgment that Zephaniah speaks of in the future, for you, that judgment has already come. For you, that day of judgment has already come and it's fallen not on you, but it's fallen on Jesus in your place. You know, the, the, listen to this in, in verse 15. Zephaniah says that day of God's judgment, uh, he says it will be a day of great darkness. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom a day of clouds and thick darkness. And you know, the prophets are pretty consistent in the way they talk about the day of God's judgment as this day of darkness. And it's no accident that each of the gospel writers, when they describe those hours when Jesus was hanging on the cross, it says there was darkness that covered the land. Why? Because as Jesus was on the cross, all of the judgment, all of the wrath of God for the sins of his people, it was being poured out on him. He was enduring that judgment in our place for us so that we can know if we are in Jesus, our judgment day, that's already come for us. And what that means is not only do we not have to be afraid of this, this king judging us, but it means we don't have to be afraid to submit ourselves to him. Because our God, get this, our God is not a God like Molech. He is not a God like Molech who says, I demand that you sacrifice that which is most precious to you in order to get my blessing. We worship a God who said, I will sacrifice myself in order to give you my blessing. And friends, that's a God you can trust. That's an authority you can submit to. Some of you have been abused by authorities that you've submitted to. 
But you see, this God is a God who, when he calls us to surrender, to submit to him as our king, he uses that authority not to oppress us, but to bless us. And so we rejoice that he is our king who will come. More than that, not only is he our king, he's our captain. He's our captain. Now, captain, that's not a word we use very often, at least in kind of a a military context, but it's a a reference back to to warfare in um, the days before sort of modern warfare when you might be fighting hand-to-hand in a battle. And in the midst of that battle, if you have a captain, a captain is is a great warrior. A captain is a great knight who can go out and defend you, somebody who doesn't just fight beside you, but somebody who's willing to fight for you, to go and put himself between you and your enemies. That's what a captain is. And listen to the way that that Zephaniah describes God as our captain. He says that our captain will clear away our enemies, chapter 315, Then in verse 17, he says, our God is a mighty warrior who saves. A God who doesn't just fight alongside us, a God who's willing to fight for us, to put himself between us and our enemies. And how does he do that? Look at verse 15. It says that this this captain has taken away the judgments against us. Friends, isn't that what Jesus has done for us? He was willing to be our captain. He was willing to go and put himself between us and our enemies of of sin and death to clear away the judgments against us. And Zephaniah says, if you know that your God is a God who has fought for you, who will fight for you in this way, he says, "What, what should be the result? What should be our response? If we know that God is our captain who fights for us, listen to this, he says, the response should be, never again will you fear any harm. Do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. If you know your God is a God who fights for you to clear away your enemies, you do not have to be afraid. And listen, the people in Zephaniah's day, I think they had a lot more reasons to be afraid than you and I may today. I mean, they they knew that any day an invading army from Babylon or from Egypt might come. And in those days, there were no Geneva Conventions. There's no international criminal courts. The brutality with which an invading army would conquer, I I think would would be absolutely terrifying to us. It makes maybe our next performance review seem a little less uh, scary in comparison, but but I think all of us know what it's like to be afraid. I mean, I wonder what, what in your life right now are you most afraid of? What produces the most fear when you meditate and dwell on it? It's probably different for all of us. Uh, But all of us have fears that can undo us, fears that cripple us, fears that feel like they are overwhelming to us. All of us have fears that sometimes keep us from being the people that God calls us to be, from doing what we know is right, from following Jesus in the way that we, that we should. And yet what Zephaniah is saying here is he's saying, look, if you have a God who is your captain, a God who fights for you, who has cleared away your enemies, you do not have to be afraid. Your hands do not to hang, have to hang limp. That you can take courage if you know that your God is your captain who fights for you. Sometimes at the start of my day, especially if I know I'm gonna have a, an anxiety-inducing conversation, some interaction that I am, am scared of, I, I will pray this prayer to Jesus and I say, Jesus, you are my captain. You have already fought my greatest enemies for me. You have already removed sin and death from me. There is nothing that can separate me from your love. Even if I were to die today, all that can do is bring me into your glorious presence. And so even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear because you are my captain. You fight for me. But then lastly, not only is he our king and our captain, but he's our brother. He's our brother who is proud of us, our brother who sings over us. If you only take away one thing from the sermon this morning, do not miss what Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 says. This is one of the most incredible ways of describing how God feels towards his redeemed people. Zephaniah says that the God who will come in our midst 
doesn't come just to save us, but he will rejoice over us, that he exalts over us with loud singing. And this is a a verse that reminds me of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, which says that, that Jesus, having faced death for us, having made us holy through his holiness, that now he is not ashamed to call us brothers. He's not ashamed to call us sisters. He is proud to call you a brother. He's proud to call you a sister. He delights in you. His attitude toward you is that he sings over you. It brings him great delight to look upon you. And and friends, look, I I don't know whose approval matters most to you in your life. I don't know if you had a big brother that you looked up to, that you admired. Maybe maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's a teacher, maybe it's a boss, and you know if they approve of you, maybe it's your spouse. And if they love you, if they approve of you, right, you feel like you can face anything. But if you don't have their approval, you you, you feel absolutely um, terrible. You you feel beat down. You feel um, little, little confidence or courage. And all of us, we need approval. All of us, we need to know that, that, that those that we look to for that approval, that they, they approve, they admire us. And, and you see, what Zephaniah is saying here is he's saying, look, God, when he, when he rescues you, when he saves you, it's not just that he forgives you and says, all right, now I'll put up with them. Now I'll tolerate them. But no, he he rejoices in us. He delights in us. We have the approval of the person in the universe whose approval matters more than anyone else's. Because we are praiseworthy? No. Because he was praiseworthy for us in spite of our flaws, in spite of our failures. And now he rejoices over you. And for us to know that, to know, look, regardless of of how good looking you are, regardless of how smart you are, regardless of how much money you have or what you've accomplished, that your God is a God who sings over you, who delights in you. Friends, that's the approval that our hearts long for more than any other. Uh, every, Every night for the last week and a half, We've been reading the same book to our son, Pat, and he loves this book. It's called You Are Special. Maybe some of you have read it before. It's by an author named Max Lucado, and it's about this this little village of Wemmix, these little wooden creatures created by a craftsman named Eli. And all day, these Wemmix, they do the same thing. They give each other stickers. They give stars to the other Wemmix who are talented, who are beautiful, who are doing impressive things, And then they give dots. They give dots to the Wemmix who mess up, whose paint is chipping, who um, do things that aren't so impressive. And Punchinello is a Wemmick who has only dots. All he gets are dots, and he feels pretty badly about it. Uh, But one day, he meets another Wemmick named Lucia. And Lucia, he notices, she doesn't have any stickers at all. It's not that anybody doesn't try to give her stickers. They do. They give her stars. They give her dots. They just don't stick to her. And he asks her, he says, why? Why don't the the stickers stick to you? Why don't you have any stickers? And she says, why don't you go and see Eli, the craftsman, to find out? And so he does. Punchinello goes to see Eli. And as he's looking around in Eli's workshop, Eli says, Punchinello? And he looks up and he says, you know my name? And he says, of course I do. I made you. You are mine. You are special. And you see, in the course of that that conversation, he tells Punchinello, Punchinello says, why don't any of the, the stickers stick to Lucia? He says, because she has decided that what I think of her matters more than what anyone else thinks of her. And he says, remember, come to me every day and remember that I think you are special. And as he walks out, he begins to believe that, and one of his dots falls to the ground as he does. And I love that story. I love getting to read that um, with Patton as this reminder each night that the king of the universe doesn't just say, I forgive you, but he delights in you. He sings over you. He quiets you with his love. He is our brother who is so proud of us. He is our captain who fights for us. 
that he's our king who rules over us in a way that does not oppress us, but blesses us. And friends, if you believe that, that can fill you with a joy that doesn't take the sorrows out of your life, but a joy that often overwhelms those sorrows. A joy that enables you to face anything in your life. To know that your God is a God who has rescued and saved you in that way. And Zephaniah says there's one thing that we are supposed to do in response to this incredibly good news. You know what that is? He says, sing. Sing in response to this good news. This is verse 14. It says this. It says, sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Rejoice and be glad with all your heart. Can I tell you, there are some truths that are so good and so beautiful that it is not enough to simply believe them. It's not enough to simply affirm them. There are some truths that are so great that you have to sing them to be fully affected by them. For them to get into your mind and into your heart and into your body, there's something about singing that engages the whole person. Can I tell you, I don't think it's enough just to sing to God four songs, maybe three if the sermon goes too long on a Sunday. That's not enough singing. These truths are so great that we need to be singing them to God in response to him, working them into our hearts more than that throughout the week. I wonder, do you do that? Do you you sing worship music throughout the week? Maybe when you wake up, that's what I like to do when I I first wake up in the morning when I'm making my coffee and I'm getting ready um, for my quiet time, I'll I'll put on some some music and I'll I'll sing along to it because I know I need to awaken my heart to the reality of God's goodness to me in that way. Maybe as you are getting ready for work, maybe as you're driving your kids to school, maybe as you're driving to work to be able to put on that music and not just hear it but to sing to it engages our hearts with the truth of this is our God. This is the God who sings over us, who delights in us, and we respond in that singing to him. So we'll do that again in just a moment, but before we do, would you pray with me as we come to the Lord's table together? God, we thank you that you are our king, that you rule over our lives, not to oppress us, but to bless us. We thank you that you are a king who would lay down your life for us. We pray that in response to that self-giving love, we would be a people who would surrender to you, whatever it is in our hearts and our lives today that we've been holding back, would we surrender that to you in response to your self-giving love? Lord, whatever we've been afraid of, I pray that you would comfort those fears as we look to you, the one who fights against our greatest enemies of sin and death. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would fill us with joy to know that you are a God who delights in us, who's proud of us, that you have traded our shame for your renown. Lord, to know that if we have your smile and your favor, that is what we most long for and need. Take these truths that we have affirmed this morning and bring them home to our hearts as we receive the Lord's Supper, as we join our voices to sing and worship together. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. On the night our Lord Jesus